Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Facial Pain Association webinar series. My name is Allie Kubik, and I serve on the board of directors for the FPA, but I am also a facial pain patient. Uh, during tonight's webinar, Dr. Jeffrey Brown, who's chair of the Facial Pain Association's Medical Advisory Board, will be interviewing Dr. Stephen Chang, who is professor and vice chair, chairman of strategic development and innovation at the Department of Neurosurgery at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. We invite you to um, submit your questions throughout the webinar and we will answer as many as we can at the end of the webinar. All right, go Good evening ahead. everybody and before we get started I want to remind everyone that the Facial Pain Organization is having their biannual national meeting at the University of California, San Diego, November 2nd uh, this year. And um, if you don't get enough information in this one hour brief session, you might consider joining us then. Also, if you don't remember everything, this is going to be posted on our website so you can listen to us ad infinitum, though I don't recommend that. So, um, Dr. Chang, I am going to show you the first question on my mind, if I can figure out how to do this, and it is cyber knife. What kind of a knife is a cyber knife? Tell me about it. Uh, so um, first of all, uh, uh, Jeff, thanks for uh, you and the um, Facial Pain Association um, uh, to have me on as a guest. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to talk with you again. Um, so your question, what is a cyber knife or what kind of knife is a cyber knife? Um, so uh, the cyber knife is not a true knife in, in the sense uh, that a scalpel is uh, for a surgeon. Um, but in terms of what the name CyberKnife means, I think we have to think back to when the CyberKnife was developed. It was developed by a neurosurgeon, a, a colleague of mine named John Adler, uh, who as a practicing neurosurgeon uh, uh, developed the concept and then eventually led to the actual development of the CyberKnife. Um, so the CyberKnife is a form of radio surgery, very similar to the Gamma Knife. Um, and the cyber knife was, the name is derived from the use of computer technology, so hence the name cyber, and then the knife representing um, precision um, uh, accuracy by a surgeon. So cyber knife is kind of computer derived, um, you know, uh, a computer derived scalpel in that sense to to deliver a treatment, but it's 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 not conventional surgery. It's a it's a focused radiation treatment. Um, people want to know: Is there a gold standard for radio surgery? Is the gamma knife the gold standard? Is one better than another? What's the difference? So, um, from from a patient standpoint. Um, but the, the machines, I think, are, are fairly comparable. Um, both are forms of what's called stereotactic radiosurgery, and both machines can deliver a high precision dose of radiation to a target, be it a brain tumor or, in the case of trigeminal neuralgia, the trigeminal nerve. Um, the, there are some differences in terms of source of radiation. A gamma knife has radioactive cobalt as the radiation source. Uh, whereas a cyber knife is a linear accelerator and uses um, uh, X-ray photons as the radiation source, um, but they're they're comparable in terms of of accuracy. So rather than one machine being better than the other, I, I think um, either machine is reasonable for uh, treatment of trigeminal neuralgia in experienced hands. Are there some patients who would be better suited, should they choose radio surgery, to cyber knife versus gamma knife in terms of the patients, um, not in terms of the accuracy? The, um, 
That's that's a good question. I've, I've found that over the years that nearly all the patients that uh, I've treated on the cyber knife or trigeminal neuralgia could have very well have been treated on a gamma knife. Um, there, I'm trying to think in my mind if there are any exceptions uh, to that. And I, I think, you know, I'm hard pressed to really come up with a specific patient um, that you could not treat with, uh, you know, uh, the other modality. So I, I, I would say that that from a specific patient standpoint, that no, they're both comparable. This is a, a softball question. Does anyone in the United States have more experience than you with the cyber knife? Um, that, so we, we've had the fortunate luxury of, of working with a cyber knife for uh, over 20 years now. It was a technology that was developed here at Stanford um, using a lot of the, the advances in Silicon Valley. So um, we've had we've had the luxury of being able to use that technology longer than other centers. Um, we we had an interest in trigeminal neuralgia radio surgery with a cyber knife um, since uh, you know the 1990s. We previously were doing um, radio surgery before we had that cyber knife using frame-based linear accelerators. So we had been treating trigeminal neuralgia patients um, um, as early as the late 1980s. Um, but with the advent of the cyber knife technology, we switched about 1999 to treating all of our patients, not just trigeminal neuralgia, but all patients that required uh, radio surgery to the uh, cyber knife um, technology. Um, so, uh, you know, in that sense, we've been doing it a long time. I'm not, you know, uh, there, there are other very active cyber knife centers and there are other very good surgeons that, that do radio surgery. So I, you know, I don't know specific numbers of, of who yeah. is doing what um, right now, but, um, you know, I, 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 do, I do agree that it's important um, to be seen at an experienced center, whether it's a gamma knife or cyber knife, if you're, if you're seeking treatment for trigeminal neuralgia. Just to clarify, when you use the word linear accelerator, I would think Pickle have this image of something out of Star Wars, which is 10 miles long and throwing strange electrons into fields at people. So tell them what a linear accelerator means in terms of the cyber knife, if you could. So that's a, that's a good point because, um, and you're correct that, you know, originally linear accelerators were very large uh, machines um, taking up large amounts of space and weighing tons and tons of uh, pounds. Um, but one of the advances that led to even the CyberKnife technology um, being even possible was the shrinkage uh, of the linear accelerator to a much smaller volume. So now we're talking about something that's potentially two feet by three feet. Uh, and you know weighs on the order of uh, a few hundred pounds rather than tons, and that allowed the linear accelerator to be fixated onto a robotic arm, which was one of the other advances that led to the development of a cyber knife. So we, we've, as with with most technology, um, we're able to shrink down what was previously very large pieces of equipment to smaller pieces of equipment. So this robotic arm, now the other image people might have of this robot that could take over on its own and move around. How is this robot controlled? How is it programmed? What, what does it, how does it know what to do? What so, is it? Yeah, very good question. So um, the, the robot is, is similar to robots that you might um, see or visualize or imagine on an automobile assembly line. It's, it's a, robot that can can move with high precision, um, but it is directed by computers uh, to uh, uh, point the linear accelerator and direct the beams of radiation with the high precision. So in, in medical technology, the speed of the robot is slowed down substantially. So we don't have a robot moving two meters a second around the patient because that would potentially look scary for a patient. So the robot moves at 10% of, of, of this normal maximum speed on a kind of a, on a factory type of setting um, to a much more slower um, speed. And, but it, it still allows the same precision of accuracy in terms of delivering uh, the radiation. And the, the robot is directed by 
computer software that that determines um, the various positions at which the robot stops and delivers beams of radiation. So is this a neurosurgeon sitting at a console pushing buttons controlling this robot as it goes on or and in other words what what's the role of the neurosurgeon in the delivery of the radiation? So I, I think that the neurosurgeon has a number of roles in this whole process. I think first and foremost, the neurosurgeon determines whether an, a patient is an appropriate candidate uh, for the CyberKnife. And um, that's obviously done in a clinic setting um, before even um, you know, a treatment is considered. If the patient is a candidate for the um, CyberKnife, uh, then the neurosurgeon um, does what's called treatment planning. And then this is a, a situation that occurs prior to treatment. In our case at Stanford, we typically do it the day before the actual treatment, that where a patient comes in and with very high precision, thin slice MRI scans through the brain, we're able to target the trigeminal nerve and determine where we want to deliver the radiation. We then run through a computer algorithm that determines the optimal set of beams and trajectories to bring this radiation in. And once we're satisfied with that, we actually bring the patient in for the treatment. So what happens on the day of the treatment? Uh, on the day of the treatment, the patient is um, arrives and is placed on the CyberKnife treatment table. At that point, the CyberKnife computer directs the radiation beams. The, the work by the neurosurgeon has been all done up until that point. Um, involving the planning and approving the trajectory, but the actual delivery of the beams is all performed by a computer with the neurosurgeon essentially just monitoring the, the steps during the treatment. The neurosurgeon is not actually driving with a joystick or a computer mouse during the actual treatment. That's all being directed by the computer. So you have to screw anything into your patient's head to get this thing to be accurate? Uh, you actually do not, and that's one of the differences between um, um, the CyberKnife and most of the GammaKnife machines out there. Um, a GammaKnife maintains accuracy by a rigid metal head frame that's attached to the patient's head and immobilizes the head. Uh, the CyberKnife, well, the way it maintains accuracy is it tracks the patient's position in, in near real time, and if the patient were to move or cough or adjust their body position on the treatment table, the computer detects that motion and adjusts and compensates for that, that motion. So one of the nice things about the CyberKnife is it's a frameless technology. Let me backtrack. The neurosurgeon's responsible for determining who's a candidate. So what kind of a patient is a candidate for this? So uh, very good question. And then that, that's, I think, one of the um, challenges that some patients face when um, determining treatment for trigeminal neuralgia, because um, there are um, patients that are candidates for multiple procedures. Um, and it can be sometimes difficult for patients to work through the thought process of determining which one of the you know, several treatments that they're a candidate for would, would be ideal for them. Um, so, um, you know, the, the alternative treatments that I think many of the um, attendees are aware of are uh, microvascular decompression uh, or some of the percutaneous procedures for uh, an example. And uh, so I think it's, it's the primary responsibility of the neurosurgeon to discuss um, all the options that are available for each a patient um, to discuss the pros and cons of those options, and uh, that will allow the patient at least the information to make a, a educated um, decision. Now, there are some patients that um, would be better candidates um, for a, a CyberKnife than, let's say, an average patient, and that might be a, um, a patient that um, has significant medical comorbidities or medical problems that would prevent them from tolerating a procedure in the operating room. Um, it may be a patient that's um, uh, particularly elderly um, that, you know, a, a general anesthetic for microvascular decompression 
uh, may not be ideal. Uh, it could be a patient that has um, previously had a microvascular decompression and the pain has recurred. And, uh, you know, the, the radio surgery, or in this case, the cyber knife, may be a good alternative um, uh, for them to undergo that treatment. I've got to come back to that. <clears throat> I just want to deal with the term elderly. By elderly, you mean frail. You don't mean over the age of 60 what or 70 what. You that, mean their health condition. It's a leader. Very, very good question. I, I'm, I'm a big believer that chronologic age is not uh, determined whether one is elderly. I think it's it, it's more what other medical conditions they they actually have. Um, so there are there are 80 year old patients that are in great shape. Um, and there are patients that are much younger that have a number of other medical problems, for example, congestive heart failure or on blood thinners or um, have, have other issues that would make them um, potentially not ideal candidates for a surgical procedure in the operating room. So that's, that's part of the job as, the, as a neurosurgeon is to determine you know, does the patient have factors outside of the trigeminal neuralgia that would help us guide some of the recommendations we may make to the patient? So I'm going to be nice to my professor and substitute, say, the word frail for elderly. Just a comment. Okay. Let, me, let me show you a case because you mentioned a few things. Let me, let me change the direction here and see if I can show you a case which will potentially illustrate. Can you see that? Yes. So this is a case of a 57-year-old woman who's had 10 years of right stabbing facial pain. And I won't take you through the long discussions, but let's just say someone then does an MRI scan. And this is what it shows. I'll let you talk a little bit, or you can think first. You're allowed to. Okay. So this is a... Um, uh, axial MRI scan or essentially a horizontal MRI scan through uh, the brain and um, the patient's pain is located on the right side and so um, the the right side of the patient's head is when we're looking at the computer screen is on, on our left side because it's the images are inverted um, and you can see they have a R for right and L for left on each of the sides so the area in question down by the trigeminal nerve is, is where this large arrow is pointing to. So in this case, the, there is a mass, there is a enhancing mass, a white appearing colored mass in the region of the trigeminal nerve. Um, so this uh, makes me suspicious that there is a tumor uh, of some sort that is pushing on the trigeminal nerve or a tumor in conjunction with a vascular abnormality, a blood vessel abnormality pushing on the uh, trigeminal nerve. So the next question is, I'm putting you on the spot, what would you consider as the options for her treatment? So um, the there, there are several options that um, we can discuss with, with this particular individual. The first is that, um, so she, she has more than trigeminal neuralgia. She has, a, you know, trigeminal pain plus a, what looks like to be a brain tumor, most likely a meningioma. Um, Which is a benign tumor, so the audience knows that's what you're saying. Benign. Yeah, meningiomas are, tend to be benign, slow-growing tumors, and they cause problems by compressing normal neurologic structures. In this case, they, this compression of the trigeminal nerve may be leading to this pain. Um, so um, there are some patients that once they're diagnosed with a tumor, um, you know, would want to address both the facial pain and the tumor. And, and, and by addressing the tumor, they may be interested in, in pathology and obtaining tissue to establish a diagnosis. If that were the case, um, you know, one option to offer this patient would be um, a surgical removal of the portion of the tumor in the area of the trigeminal nerve. That will allow you to obtain tissue for the pathologist. And so you will understand with certainty what type of tumor you're dealing with, but it also will allow you to 
um, decompress the trigeminal nerve. And if, if the tumor is directly pushing on the nerve, that could be causing the pain. In a lot of these situations, the tumor is actually pushing a blood vessel further into the trigeminal nerve. Um, so that's a, a, you know, by removing the tumor and then decompressing the, the blood vessel off of the nerve, you can alleviate the pain. Um, so that's certainly one option. Uh, another option to potentially um, consider is you could use radiation cyberknife to treat this. Um, the the challenge is normally when you use uh, the cyberknife or other forms of radio surgery to treat the trigeminal nerve, you actually can see the nerve and you can deliver the radiation to the nerve and target it. Uh, in this particular case, um, based upon the size and shape of this meningioma tumor, it's not likely um, that you're going to be able to visualize the trigeminal nerve at all in this situation. Um, so where does that leave us? That leaves us that if you were to choose radiosurgery, you essentially would be treating the tumor. There's a meningiomas can be treated with cyberknife and with other forms of radiosurgery. So you could treat this tumor with radiation. And there are some patients that by treating the tumor, uh, their, their pain gets better. It's, it's, you I'm know, going to interrupt. You're giving a brilliant speech there. I'm going to tell you that in this particular case, this woman um, declined open surgery for the tumor and she was treated with radiation. Okay. gamma radiation directed towards the tumor. Okay. Nothing happened. Her pain is still there. The tumor is still there. The next thing was a neurosurgeon tried to do what's called a radiofrequency thermal rhizotomy to treat the pain because she didn't want the open surgery. And the surgeon had trouble getting complete pain relief. He was able to get some numbness in the jaw area, but because of the presence of the tumor, he couldn't, despite two reasonable efforts, heat the trigeminal nerve successfully. So now she's faced with severe stabbing pain for which she's suicidal. Okay, and is she is she now willing to consider a surgical approach to this, or is that still off yeah. the table? So I'm going to jump in and throw this at you. So what this is is a Fiesta study with a bunch of arrows thrown yep. in. Can okay. you see? I, I I think I might have a little. Here's a little better image without the arrows. And in what the Fiesta says is, lo and behold, you can see the trigeminal nerve. And this, which potentially is an artery, and this, which is potentially a vein. OK. So it, it, trigeminal nerve, which is not so hidden. Yeah. So this looks like, um, so but it, it so you, you now can see most of the segment of the trigeminal nerve that's that's in what we call the prepontine cistern or in the segment that we would normally target with with radio surgery. But it also looks like there is a vascular compression um, of you know at least in the upper the coronal view. I, it looks like that the arrow is pointing to a blood vessel pushing the trigeminal nerve. Is that correct, Jeff? Correct. Okay, so so you're. I think these these images are a little bit more clear now, and just saying that you know, you, you you it does look like now potentially the tumor is pushing um, a blood vessel, um, in this case one artery and one vein onto the trigeminal nerve. In addition, you can now see the length of the trigeminal nerve. Um, I, I in these situations where I see a vascular compression from a tumor. Um, you know, certainly my first thought would be um, a surgical decompression of the, to, to debulk the tumor and move the blood vessels off of the nerve um, to achieve a, a vascular decompression. Okay. In fact, this was my patient and what I proposed and what I did was treat the problem, which was her trigeminal neuralgia 
move the artery, and the second part was a vein. This is a vein on top of the nerve, and I did not debulk or touch the tumor. Okay. I left it alone, and her pain was relieved from that. Just a little bit different, but you could have one could have debulked the tumor, but she didn't. She hadn't wanted surgery in the first place, so I left her with the tumor. The radiation should treat the tumor, I believe. Correct. Yeah. And we treated the problem. Let me show you another case. I did. I'm, you did really wonderful. I'm putting you on the spot, and I apologize. But this is to this is to the point that you discussed earlier. This is a woman, 42 years old. She has something called a Chiari malformation, which you can explain, which had been decompressed twice. And in neither case did the decompression treat what she has was stabbing right facial pain. So then she had an MRI and um, she, she's got an arrow here. You can describe what we're seeing. This is the right side. Okay, so where this is again looks like a Fiesta sequence MRI scan, which is a sequence that we like to look at when we look at nerves and blood vessels because um, it's a sequence that gives us very good imaging of the relationship between the nerve and a blood vessel. And I also should um, backtrack a little bit and talk about, just mention briefly what a Chiari malformation is. It's a Chiari malformation in, in simple terms is a compression of some of the brain tissue in the back of the head uh, by, by bone. In other words, the, think of it as the bone being a little bit tight. And so um, a Chiari decompression is a surgery to remove some of the bone along the back of the head to provide a little bit more space for um, the brain and upper part of the spinal cord. Um, but these, the, the image slice that we're looking at right now on the MRI scan is um, above the level where we would, you know, see the post-operative changes from the Chiari malformation. And the arrow is pointing to um, the trigeminal nerve um, just after it exits the brain stem, uh, but before it leaves um, the skull. Uh, and there, there are a number of blood vessels that are in um, proximity and abutting the trigeminal nerve on the right side. So uh, in this case, this was my patient, I did perform a microvascular decompression, thought I was doing a very wonderful job of decompressing what turned out to be a loop, an arterial loop off of her nerve, and she didn't get better. She still had stabbing pain. And I did this MRI afterwards to see if I had adequately decompressed the trigeminal nerve. And I'll leave you to describe whatever it is you think we see there, which is the best image I could come up with. Okay. Um, how many blood vessels did you see when you did the decompression? Was it just it one? Was one artery that was underneath the nerve that I mobilized and um, separated from the nerve. Okay. Which is um, to say, this is kind of hard to interpret, but she still has pain. She doesn't want another operation, so I'm going to turn you loose as to where you would go with someone who has persistent pain after a microvascular decompression that appears to be properly done. I'm okay. setting. Sure. Um, so um, I think you've touched on a couple of key points here. Um, the, the, the first point is if a patient still has pain after a microvascular decompression, I, I do think um, it's important to obtain a new MRI scan um, for two reasons. One is to look at the, the, the area along the trigeminal nerve um, to see if there has been an adequate decompression. And sometimes that can be a challenge because those Teflon pledgets that we put in um, can, can obscure the, the nerve and make it harder to see the nerve itself. Um, we also wanna make sure that there isn't um, a, a second blood vessel that was not fully appreciated at the time of surgery. Um, so that's another reason why to, to do the MRI scan. So in this, you know, usually we have a number of different slices and views here. So this is a very limited view. Um, I see the trigeminal nerve on the right side. It looks like there is some packing material along the root entry zone, which is the portion of the nerve closest to the, the brain stem. 
Um, it, you know, I, it, I can't tell for sure if there isn't any other vessel there. Um, you know, I, you know, if- but That's, that's I, part of the problem. It's really hard to tell, even though we do the study. Right. My question is, you mentioned radio surgery after failed MBD, so I want to bring that up. Is this a person who is a candidate for that, and how would you go about doing it? Yeah, so so with assuming adequate decompression, no other blood vessels, this patient would uh, be a candidate um, for radio surgery. Um, and uh, you know, essentially, we th th this the simple answer to this is you you perform it very similar to the way you would perform radio surgery if there wasn't a, a microvascular decompression. You you would target the trigeminal nerve. Um, the challenge can sometimes be, again, with the Teflon pledges put in place at the time of the surgery, the microvascular decompression surgery, that can sometimes make it difficult to um, see the trigeminal nerve as clearly as you could in a patient that has not had um, a microvascular decompression. But, but the short answer to your question is that yes, this patient is someone we would, we would consider for a radiosurgical procedure. But you can target the trigeminal nerve even though it's hard to see. That's my we, question. We, we, yeah, it, it takes a little bit more effort. You may need to bring some of the neuroradiology colleagues on board, but, but for the most part, you can um, target the trigeminal nerve adequately after microvascular decompression. Actually, that's my question. Is Are the neuroradiologists part of the team that um, works with you when you do the cyber knife radiosurgery, or is it the neurosurgeon with the radiation therapist alone? So it's um, the standard team is a neurosurgeon, a radiation oncology physician, and medical physicist. Um, on complex cases um, where we want additional input on the anatomy, we will bring in a neuroradiologist um, to kind of um, provide yet a, a third pair of eyes. Okay. Um, talk a little bit, one of the questions is, um, what's the likelihood of the radiosurgery treating the pain long-term? What's the likelihood that the pain will come back? Is it any different with the, than the likelihood with the microvascular decompression? And um, if it comes back, what kinds of things are possible? Would you repeat the radio surgery? I have a lot of questions at once. I'm going to step away for a second while you answer. Okay. Um, so I have about like five or eight questions um, together, but I'll, I'll try to do them in order. So the, the simple concept with radio surgery is that the radiation is damaging the pain fibers within the trigeminal nerve so that they can no longer conduct the pain. That's, that's the simple version of the story. So um, it, it can take a little while after you do the radio surgery for the pain fibers to respond to the radiation. So unlike a microvascular decompression or a percutaneous procedure in which many case, patients experience immediate pain relief, with the, the stereotactic radio surgery with a gamma knife or cyber knife, it can take on the order of a few weeks to a few months to see the impact that the radiation has on the, the nerve. Now, what's the, what's the long-term success rate of radio surgery? Now, in, in, um, in um, patients that undergo microvascular decompression, if they have good pain relief, for the most part, it tends to be durable. Um, with radio surgery, um, you often have pretty high rates of short-term pain relief, but over time, that um, the durability of that pain relief is not quite as good as it is with the microvascular decompression. And conceptually, um, the way I describe it to patients and what may be happening is that the nerve um, sustains some initial damage to the pain fibers that makes the pain go away. Oftentimes, that's what you can have numbness as a side effect uh, of the radiosurgical treatment. Now, your, your body's natural tendency for any type of injury, including radiation injury, is an attempt to heal. Um, and in this situation, the bo your body doesn't know that this might be the one exception where it shouldn't try to heal. And so what you, your, your body can, can sabotage you because it tries to repair the damage 
that the radiation is done. And, and um, over time, this repair, reparative mechanism can lead to these pain fibers recovering from the radiation treatment. And this can lead to recurrence of pain. Um, so the, 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 the rough data I typically quote uh, my patients with the um, radio surgery is probably about a 50% chance of recurrence over five years. I use the 50% five-year rule. Um, there are patients that undergo radio surgery that have decades of pain relief, um, lifetime of pain relief. And there are other patients where, um, you know, the nerve maybe recovers more quickly than we even anticipated. And so you don't even get five years of pain relief. But I think kind of 50% at five years is, is a reasonable ballpark. Um, so, so what happens if the pain comes back? Um, there is an option to repeat the course of radio surgery, repeat either the gamma knife or the cyber knife. And in that sense, you're just delivering a second dose of radiation to the nerve, um, damaging the pain fibers again with the hope that maybe this time they won't recover. Um, there, there is data out in the medical literature that shows that um, you know a second course of radio surgery does achieve some long-term pain relief in, in some patients. Um, um, not Again, not as good as typically what we typically quote for microvascular uh, decompression. Um, we talked about how numbness is, is often a, a um, side effect of the radiosurgical treatment. Um, the, the trigeminal nerve, in addition to the pain fibers, carries the sensory fibers. So if you do have numbness in, the, in, in your face as a result of radiosurgery, the, the thought is that means the nerve has been perhaps more heavily impacted by the radiation than those patients with, without numbness. And it's been my experience that those patients that have facial numbness after radiosurgery tend to be less likely to have recurrence of their pain than those patients that don't have numbness. Uh, out of curiosity, do you have a large volume series of patients who've you done, who, in whom you've done repeat CyberKnife for? Um, we've, I, I would estimate we've probably done a second course of CyberKnife on between 75 and 100 patients. You do, um, yes. That is a large series. So okay. we, we're, we're do you dose them the same as you had originally, or do you drop it by 50% or 10%, or how do you discern? Yeah, so so the short answer is we typically dose them the same as before, and, and the, the rationale for that is that, um, you know, on one hand, you might argue maybe giving a lower dose because it's the second time around might be appropriate, but on the flip side, if a certain dose did not give you long-term pain relief the first time around, it seems almost counterintuitive to give a lower dose the second time around if the initial higher dose did not work. So we, with those two competing kind of, you know, two competing ideas, we, we typically just give the exact same dose the second time around. I have a question that came in on this. Um, does radiation destroy deep genes? Does this radiation potentially do bad things in the long term to people that we don't know about or should worry about? So, yeah, that's a, a good question. It's a question that's commonly asked uh, by patients because um, we kind of, we, we, we all grew up with those TV shows and movies where, you know, somebody gets radiated and then, you know, something bad happens to them um, or radiation you know, turns a small lizard into Godzilla. Um, so the, the, the key here is that this radiation that we're delivering to the trigeminal nerve is very precision radiation, whether you use a gamma knife or a cyber knife. So you're, you're, you're really focusing the radiation on a very small area of, of tissue. Uh, we know radiation can cause injury to genes and cells, um, but that's, that's an issue if you're radiating large volumes of, of tissue. So if you have a radiation to your entire chest wall or into your entire head, then down the line, that might slightly increase the chance of you developing some sort of other malignancy. But with this high precision radiation, the thought is that the amount of normal tissue exposure to the radiation is, is very small. Um, 
when when patients bring you know the issue up of, of radiation and is is it doing something bad or is it causing something bad that could happen? Um, I think you need to keep in mind two things. Um, the first is that um, radiation has a very delayed effect, particularly on normal tissue. So when we talk about in the very rare instances where there there could be some late side effect of radiation, it's often decades later. And the other thing that patients often don't factor into the equation um, is that the other treatments for trigeminal neuralgia uh, are not risk-free as well. So if you're undergoing a microvascular decompression, that's an open surgery under general anesthesia, there's theoretically always a risk of not surviving the operation or having a successful operation and developing some complication you know, in the days to weeks after the surgery that can be life-threatening. Um, and oftentimes that, that risk is essentially um, um, higher potentially by order of magnitude than any kind of late effects of, of radiation on the genes. Thank you. I have a question for my personal information. If one, if you were to do CyberKnife and someone develops numbness, will that numbness likely resolve in your experience or is the numbness going to stay regardless? Uh, good question. Um, so, um, and the answer to those questions is, is both. Both possibilities are, are out there. Um, um, I've certainly had some of my patients develop numbness that is still persistent years later. Um, I've had other patients develop some numbness that over the course of several months um, seems, to, seems to get better and resolve. So um, I, I don't think there's any way to predict when a patient first develops numbness, whether it's going to going to be temporary or whether it's going to be permanent. Um, obviously, the longer the time period a patient goes with the numbness, the more likely it is not going to get better on its own. Thank you. I'm going to switch gears. You are at Stanford University, which is the research capital of the West Coast of the United States. Are there any ongoing research projects involving facial pain that you want to talk about? Um, there, um, yeah, we, we've, we've, attempted to study um, if there is a mechanism or way to reduce numbness after radio surgery or reduce the chance of numbness um, after radio surgery. And um, to keep things very simple, it was a clinical trial which um, uh, involved an infusion of some, some drugs, some chemicals prior to the radio surgery to see if that would protect the nerve so that you were less likely to develop numbness um, after after radio surgery. So that's that, that's the area we're, we're really looking at right now because frankly, if you have a patient that has good pain relief after radio surgery, um, if they have a num if they have the numbness over time, typically what I've seen is um, is as they get further and further out from the, the pain and they have a less and less memory of the pain, then the the numbness um, becomes more of a forefront to them in terms of their, their thought process. So patients up front before treatment, when they're having pain, will say they'll trade pain for numbness. Um, but then several years later, if they're pain free and, and life is good from that standpoint, we'll now comment on how the numbness is bothersome to them or tend to bite the inside of their cheek when they chew or nick themselves when they shave. So um, if there's, I think that's one area where where those of us that do radio surgery could could work to improve is to find a way to keep keep um, higher levels of pain relief after radio surgery, but but reducing the chance of the numbness. Um, I want to backtrack a little bit. We showed these MRI scans that did, and some that didn't show the trigeminal nerve. Can I give you a chance to talk a little bit about? An answer to the question: Are all MRIs created equally? Uh, that's a that's a good question, and the answer is um, when you're looking at, at the trigeminal of the answer is no. Um, the and it's less of an issue of of the machine itself. It's more of an issue of how this how the radiologist protocols the sequence, or how the radiologist determines what sequences to order. 
Um, so a lot of the images that, that Jeff, you showed are what we call Fiesta sequences on a GE scanner. Um, and I mentioned that Fiesta sequence is the ideal sequence to look at nerves and blood vessels. Um, it gives us a lot of resolution of the nerves and blood vessels. And these Fiesta sequences are very thin slices. Um, so gives us gives us very critical key information around the nerves and blood vessels. Um, also, the Fiesta sequences can be ordered in such a way that you, in addition to getting the horizontal axial Fiesta sequences that you showed, you can get vertical, what's called a coronal Fiesta sequence, and a sagittal, a profile view Fiesta sequence. So you can study the nerve and the blood vessels around the nerve from, from three different angles. And that gives you a lot of information. Yeah, this is, so this is a Fiesta sequence that shows all three views. The upper left corner is a coronal or vertical view. The lower left corner is a horizontal view. And then the lower right corner is a, what we call the sagittal view. So this is ideally the best kind of MRI sequence we, we want to see, a Fiesta study that has these three different views, um, because that gives us the maximal information about the nerve and the blood vessel relationships. So if I see a patient with trigeminal neuralgia and they come in with an MRI scan and it does not have these, these sequences, I, I order a new MRI scan. I, I really want to see these sequences, um, and, and for two reasons. If you're considering a microvascular decompression, you really want to know, is there a blood vessel um, that's impinging or touching the nerve? Because that can um, certainly give both the physician and the patient uh, you know, a degree of confidence that there is a structural abnormality that exp explains our facial pain. The other reason why we like these Fiesta sequences is that if the patient chooses to uh, pursue radio surgery, as their, their treatment choice, we target off these Fiesta sequences in terms of delivering the radiation. So for either, either surgery or um, uh, radio surgery, we like to see these Fiesta sequences. I just like to say I agree with everything that he, Dr. Chang is saying, and I keep nodding my head because it's spot on. I, I, I have, um, we have 10 or 15 minutes, and Ali, do you have some questions that have filtered through that you wanna throw in? Are you there? Yep, sure. So you touched upon the um, success rate for, or you touched on MVD and GABA knife surgery. Is the success rate limited if you have had an MVD surgery um, or versus GABA knife? Like, can you do them both? So, um, yeah. I, so a, a patient would it would have either one or the other, and then if they're still having pain, then you can consider the, the alternative. So in other words, if they've had a, a microvascular decompression and they still have pain, we talk about how we repeat an MRI scan to, to take a look at, again, at the anatomy. Um, if there's been a good decompression, we don't see any other blood vessels, then you know for, most, for many patients at that point, we would consider them a candidate for radiosurgery. Conversely, um, if a patient has had radiosurgery first, and it's either worked and then the pain recurred or, or it didn't work. But we still think that based on symptoms that they have, you know, fairly, um, you know, fairly straightforward trigeminal neuralgia type of pain. And they have a MRI scan, you know, with these Fiesta sequences that shows a vascular compression. We would, in, in a lot of these patients, consider offering them a microvascular decompression, even if they've had uh, radio surgery, and I, I'm, you know, Jeff presented that one case. It was, it was the tumor case where the patient had, you know, radiation. That case was for the tumor, not for the trigeminal algebra, but it was for the tumor. But then the patient still was a candidate for a microvascular decompression based on anatomy. Thank Allie? You. Yep. Um, in regards to dosing, how do you decide how strong or intense is it? You look at the MRI, or how do you go about? figuring out the intensity? That's a good question. So um, over, over the years, both Gamma Knife Centers and Cyber Knife Centers have, um, have adjusted the, a couple of variables. They've adjusted the length of the nerve that was exposed to the radiation, um, and they've adjusted the dosing uh, of the uh, delivered to the nerve. Um, 
the the basic answer is that if you go too low on the dosing, um, you just don't get good success rates. Um, the nerve is a pretty strong nerve. Um, it can tolerate do doses of radiation that we typically use for for tumors are much lower than the dose that we would need to use to impact the the trigeminal nerve. Um, if you drive the dose up substantially, you know, above what is common norm normally used these days, um, you you can get increasing amounts of, of numbness in the face. And you also run the risk of causing what's called radiation necrosis, which can be frank injury to the, the tissue, particularly that we worry about radiation necrosis into the brain stem. So as you drive those up substantially, uh, you know, above kind of normal levels, then then you run into that issue. So um, we, we, we have pretty well-defined doses right now. We don't adjust the dose based upon a person's MRI scan. We, we give a standard dose across the, the board for patients with trigeminal neuralgia um, for the most part. Allie? So if, um, when a person, a patient, if they elect to have cyber knife surgery, can you tell us, are they going to feel anything? Are they awake? Are they put under anesthesia? Are they given medication? What would procedure look like for someone contemplating having cyber knife? So the, the, the actual procedure itself, um, there, there's, a after you've seen the physicians in clinic, there's really two steps to the procedure. The first step is um, what's called a simulation or what I commonly call a preparation day, where a patient would come in, um, we would, if we don't have the MRI imaging, we would get the MRI imaging that day. Um, a plastic mask is constructed for the patient and the patient wears this mask during the treatment. That's to prevent the head from doing a lot of motion rolling around during the treatment. Um, so that's called the simulation or preparation day. Um, after that, the patient you know, leaves to go back home. Um, and then the neurosurgeon and the radiation oncologist and the medical physicist will work to generate the actual radiation plan that is um, loaded into the computer workstation. On the day of treatment, the patient comes in, is positioned on the um, treatment table, and there there's no IVs and you, you, you wear street clothes. It's, um, it's not a tube like an MRI scanner or a CT scanner. You can actually look up and see the ceiling, it's not, not enclosed. Um, the machine moves around the patient. It does not touch the patient at all. Uh, so it moves around the patient. There's some very soft clicking sounds as the machine stops at various positions. Um, and and as it, at each position, it delivers a small dose of radiation. So the machine may stop, for example, let's say at 100 different positions around the patient over the course of 45 minutes to an hour. And at each position, it delivers a small dose of radiation to the nerve so that cumulatively, the nerve receives the, the correct dose of uh, radiation. And then once the treatment is done, the patient um, jumps off the treatment table and can head on out to the car. There's not even an IV that needs to be taken out of the patient. At this point, uh, Dr. Chang has done a very good job of responding to our questions. Let me give you the opportunity to harp on whatever you would like to say that we haven't asked you about? Uh, I think it's um, uh, the, one of the, the first things that I think is important for physicians that, that manage facial pain is to um, determine whether or not the patient has, um, you know, very straightforward trigeminal neuralgia pain versus uh, more complex um, or esoteric type of, of pain. Because what we've covered today, when we talk about microvascular compressions and radio surgery, um, works well for very classic, straightforward trigeminal neuralgia, the type one trigeminal neuralgia. Um, it doesn't necessarily work well for um, other types of facial pain. So I, I think it's important to come away from this um, seminar um, to emphasize that, that that's an important distinction. And it, it's, um, it, it'll be up to the, the, the patient and the physicians to work through that to determine you know, whether, they, whether they, they fall into the category where it's, it's pretty straightforward trigeminal neuralgia. And the reason why this is important is that it in, impacts the success rates of the treatments. 
Um, and I think in order to set patient expectations correctly, um, you need to really determine whether or not their pain syndrome, their facial pain syndrome, um, comes in matches, you know, a very typical trigeminal neuralgia patient or a very unusual form of, of facial pain because the outcomes will be different um, for those two sets of patients. So we've opened a whole new area and talk about, do you have any specific approach to making this decision? Any kind of scale that you use or questionnaire or anything that you, judgment, how do you make this determination? I, I knew I shouldn't have answered that question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we're um, uh, at Stanford. The way that we address this problem is we we uh, developed a number of years ago a formal facial pain program that is a true multidisciplinary program. It involves about uh, 20 to 25 physicians across six different uh, departments. Um, it includes um, pain physicians, neurologists, dentists, uh, ear, nose, and throat. Uh, physicians. Um, and the concept here is that not all patients will be candidates for a surgical procedure, but we still want to have options to help those patients. So um, as a neurosurgeon, typically when I am, when I see a patient with trigeminal neuralgia, they have already, for the most part, been evaluated by a good neurologist who has actually done a lot of the screening. Um, for them, and, and, and I've been fortunate to work with a good group of them. Um, so essentially, I, I've been in the fortunate position that I can just treat the patients that I see because they've almost always been screened already as good surgical candidates or good radiosurgical candidates. Um, so I'm not usually the one involved in doing a lot of the screening process. Having said that, occasionally I do get a patient as a, a they come into our facial pain program and I'm the first person they see. Sometimes I have to backtrack a little bit and have them routed through our um, you know, facial pain neurologist just to get their input. Because it, we, we, we didn't talk at all today about, about medical management, but um, oftentimes you know, the, the first step for many of these patients is medical management with the procedures being utilized uh, once medical management fails. So let me hop in at this point and say the next webinar, which will be next month, I believe, will be on the subject of medical management with Dr. Jeffrey Cohen, who's a member of the Medical Advisory Board. And we've only been doing this for one hour, though it seems like a long time. You probably didn't get enough of Dr. Chang, and he has volunteered to be present at our national meeting, which is in November in uh, San Diego, California, and I hope many of you will be able to attend. And finally, I want to thank the board of directors who have supported this organization and allow all this to happen. And thank you all for spending the time with us. And we hope we've been of help. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.